The sudden sound of someone banging fiercely on the door brought Natsuki to her senses. Oh yes, she is. She probably nodded off in the study while planning how they would overcome the next day. I think I like her or a little bit more after in like the sixth episode or at least sympathize her with a bit. But what could it be at a time like this? More importantly, the knock itself was strange. If someone wanted to contact her, they could have just used the internal phone line. She told them that she'd be here. Realizing that something strange was going on, Natsui shook her head one more time, completely throwing off her drowsiness. <laughs> Definitely. Father! Father! Oh wait, oops, hold on. <laughs> Sorry, I thought that was Kraus. Father! Father! It's Ava! I have an urgent vital matter to discuss with you! It was Ava's voice. What is this? I thought I told him to lock the doors and windows of the mansion tightly after everyone left for the guest house. So why is Ava here? Natsu ran up to the door and responded with a small knock and spoke through the door in a quiet voice. What is it? You're too noisy! Natsuhi! Why are you in Father's study at this hour? I told you to be quiet! Have you forgotten the head values of peace and silence more than anything else? Now's not the time to be saying that! Stop harping on that and open up quickly! Bring Father out! The head just went to sleep! I don't know what business you have, but I will deal with it tomorrow! I don't have any business with you! Just open up right now! Multiple, sometimes multiple schemes and assumptions can fall apart due to the most simple and direct and emotional of strategies. This is bad. If I open the door, Ava will probably throw herself towards and rush into the study. Now I can't even open this door. At the moment, the phone suddenly rang. It's okay. Both of the keys to the study are here. No one can open this door. Natsui inched away from the door and grabbed the receiver. Hello! It's Natsuhi! It's me. Things are bad and I want you to come down to the parlor quickly. It was from Kraus. His tone was strained. When the world happened? It would seem that Balor and this guest called Erika solved the witch's epitaph and found the gold. <gasps> Is that true? Rudolph and the rest have forced their way in. They're saying Balor will show everyone the way to the hidden gold. Right now, Ava is just outside the study door yelling at me to open it. But if I do that now, she might push her way inside. I, I understand. I will go there too. Don't worry about Ava. Just stay there and don't do anything. I'll give you a signal once we've gotten Ava away from the door. So leave as soon as you hear that. Ready? Right after that, Kraus came up the staircase accompanied by Genji. A heated debate started between hi him and Ava. Open up! No, calm down. In the middle of that, there was a small knock as a signal. Krause's clever pushed Ava away from the door and distracted her. During that gap, Natsui split out of the study and quickly shut the door. Ava noticed this and her face tissed in disappointment. With heavy sound, the odd lock had already rung out and the door had been sealed. The goal of the epitaph has been found! It's only natural that we should inform Father about this! Or else what? Is there some reason you can't tell Father about this? Father gave strict orders that we not be awakened no matter what after he went to bed. Following this orders is the duty the heads represent. Isn't that right, Genji? Yes. The master's sleep must not be disturbed no matter what happens. Even a rule like that depends on the time and circumstances, doesn't it? The epitaph was solved, I mean. Father has the right to know straight away. Of course the two of us will report everything to the head tomorrow. That's our duty as the head's representatives. I don't care about that! Come on, just open this door! Just let me see Father! Father! Father, can you hear me? It's Ava! Please open up! Uh, oh, let go of me! Th that hurts! We're telling you to listen to us! Don't knock on the door so loudly! Ow! Ow! Oh! Let, let go of me! Kraus, Ava, the master is sleeping. Please refrain from disturbing him any further. When Genji spoke firmly, the two of them finally ceased their scuffle. 
and seeing Genji, the one who had spoken for Kinzo since they were very young, still possess an air of dignity strong enough to handle both Kraus and Ava. <laughs> Ava put her argument aside for the time being. She could hold off worrying about that until after she saw the gold with her own eyes. After all, not even Ava had seen it for herself yet. Natsu and the others had managed to somehow deal with the momentary crisis. However, the move of the demons that would sneer upon their efforts has already begun. Battler solved the epitaph of the riddle, you say? Oh. Balor solved the riddle of the epitaph, you say? Yes! Though he had a lot of help from that Erica girl, Battler was the one who reached the answer. Erica has proclaimed that she will abandon her rights to the Golden Land. Therefore, the one who reached the Golden Land is Battler. Fate can be truly amusing to think that Battler would make it there. What will you do, Beato? You promised to stop the ceremony if anyone solved the epitaph's riddle. Yes! That was the deal! That was the deal, indeed. Apparently, Battler does not intend to become the master of the Golden Land. And now it seems that no one will become our master. That is also fate. It has been several decades since we first manifested in the human world through our bond with Lord Goldsmith. The time since then has been so very fun. Come, Leah. You sound like an old lady. So, what are we going to do? If we go by Riche and Goldsmith's rules, now that Balor saw the epitaph and decided not to become our master, we've been relieved from the duty, right? That's true! I have no regrets at all. I have been prepared to be kicked down from Kokaitis all this time. I have no idea if I'm saying that right. Wait. We can't let that happen. You might not have any regrets, but I will keep on serving Natsuhi. It'd be quite irresponsible to let ourselves be relieved from duty just because battlers sought the epitaph. Witches are forbidden from breaking contracts, but they also must not fail to show gratitude. True. We should serve her until the family conference ends. In that case, you won't be relieved from duty for a while either, Lord Goldsmith. Perhaps we should wait until you've overcome this family conference safely, say goodbye to Natsuhi at the very least, and if possible reward her for all her efforts. Indeed! She has done very well supporting my foolish son! You're a fond angel one with the wings plucked off, aren't you? Just leave the other wing as a parting gift and go. Indeed. Perhaps that would be fitting. Natsuhi may be worthy of bearing my wing. However, we are approaching the critical moment. Your reward is waiting for you. Try to make it through this test unscathed, Natsuhi. Okay, let's see. Oops. The mountain of gold left everyone speechless. Regardless of how strongly they believe in its existence, no one could look at this much real gold and not be shocked. To think a place like this existed. I can't believe it! That dad... Everyone was stunned by the gold. The first one to break the silence and jump around in ecstasy was Hideyoshi. Letting out an excited laugh, he clung to the wall of gold. Then he felt the cold hard touch of it all over his cheek. <laughs> this is incredible! It's the real thing! <laughs> That damn dad of ours sticking this much gold in a ridiculous place. Now that we have this much, we no longer have anything to fear. With this, we can overcome any kind of trial. Rosa! Nason! Nason! We'll be able to find happiness with this, right? Ava and Rosa moved toward each other at the same time and hugged as they broke down crying. Ecstasy shot. Wonder in size. 
After stepping forward and finding the pile of gold that caused these mixed emotions, Erica spoke as though she were an answer in some show. If this world is money, then this gold is the embodiment of happiness. Congratulations, everyone. I pray that this discovery makes all of your lives richer. I take my hat off to you to think that you solved the epitaph with a single day of coming to this island. If you couldn't solve it in a single day, then you wouldn't be able to solve it no matter how many days you had. After all, it doesn't take more than an instant for your little gray cells to give you a flash of intuition. Also, I wouldn't have been able to solve this riddle myself. I ask that you praise Balor's achievement as well, everyone. I abandon any rights to this discovery. I'm already satisfied to have my reasoning proven correct. So I'd like to give Balor a full credit. I may be here, but please continue the discussion as though I wasn't. Balor called all the adults here, making sure that none of the cousins would notice. That can only mean one thing. He must have wanted to begin the true family conference with all of you. And that also means that I'm also wanting to watch all of you as you all argue like idiots. Erica, quit deciding things on your own. My apologies. In that case, I'll step down as a facilitator of these proceedings. So, who will take my place? Shrugging, Erica looked around at everyone. After a short period of silence, Ava made the first move. <laughs> nice! <laughs> quotation mark, quotation mark. None of us have forgotten the deal that we made earlier today, right? Ugh, the, here's the bitch bitch whine of the argument. Here we go. Oy. Yeah. Divided between the four of us with 2.5 billion for each. We all already know this, and the successor gets another 10 billion. Wait a second! Who decided that one who discovers the gold becomes the successor? Hold up! You'll be able to get away with that, Natsuhi! We've all been arguing based on that premise this whole time, haven't we? You really think you can pretend that that never happened now? That's right. Weren't you the one worrying about how one of the servants saw the world they might consider themselves the successor? <laughs> yeah, but they're totally not gonna listen to Balor because he's a kid. But nowhere is it explicitly written that that's the truth, right? You bastard! We were all aware of it, weren't we? That's right, Aniki. Aren't you gonna change your position this late in the game? Though it was never stipulated, I believe it was common knowledge between us. I don't see how you can suggest that we would ignore it completely. You can't just interrupt the head. Interpret the heads epitaph however you like. Okay, whatever. I don't care about their argument. <laughs> what is it when the one who buys the gold becomes a successor? Okay, Erica already told about that. So I, I don't care. They're just arguing about the same shit over and over again. The epitaph was tied upon the head. You have no right to decide these things for yourselves. I, I don't okay, I don't care. So calm down, Natsuhi. How could I calm down? Yes, I do find it quite impressive that Balor saw the epitaph. I certainly believe that he should be rewarded for it. However, it's clearly a stretch to suggest that he deserves half of everything. And you won't get away with the argument that the discoverer becomes his assessor. That's low, Natsuhi. This is completely different from what you were saying earlier today. I agree. Though it was never stipulated, the fact that whoever solves the epitaph becomes his assessor has always been the greatest unwritten rule that we had. It's not fair if you start complaining about that at the last second, right? Yeah, it isn't fair. Anyway, this gold is father's. We can't decide how it'll be split up without father's permission. No, Ser seriously, Natsuhi, come on. No way, that's low, Natsuhi. We're talking about this on the earlier and on and on, right? You're saying the whole conversation today was a bunch of bull. It just ain't right. Why don't we just vote on it? Battler, the one who found the gold, is the successor. My husband and I have no objections. What about you, Rudolph and Kyrie? Rosa! No objections here. Nice going, Balor. I have no objections either. Balor is the true successor chosen by the epitaph. If you are satisfied, then why don't we just ask Father directly? Seriously, Natsuhi, you really should just agree with them. It would just be easier that way, I think. And I also don't care about their arguments, so I'm just trying to breeze through. That's right. Just like you said, Natsuhi, Father is one who wrote the riddle of the epitaph. And he's also not the pro he's also the proper owner of this gold. In that case, shouldn't we talk to Father about this directly? How should Balor, the person who discovered the gold, be treated? I believe Father is the only one capable of making such a decision. <laughs> but but 
didn't I tell you to calm down? Rosa and Kiri are right. Let's ask father. Your turn is already over, Nissan. Natsuhi. Yeah, yeah, bring father out to us. We won't get away with you two. Let's just re get in the real family conference. This is a lesson you can follow just because he's tired. If we take this thing lightly, we'll have a massive problem on our hands. Hey, are you listening? We won't get anywhere with just you. Bring father out right now. I really don't care, so I have to breeze through it. Our family conference is always like this. How the hell do I know? They're probably always like this on the inside. <laughs> it looks like they won't be able to get this figured out right away without Kinzo. To think he's being called out to sell his children's fight, even though it's been announced that he only has a short while to live. I wonder how he feels right about now. Dead. <laughs> Imagining that? No. Reasoning that out will be a treat. The parents ignored Balor and Erica kept yelling at each other on and on. And even though Balor had more or less imagined that this sort of thing happened behind the scenes, this was the first time he'd seen it. He suspected it since six years ago, and he'd been a while to get a pretty good idea of what it was like by the darkening expressions on his parents' faces when this time of year drew near. However, this argument his relatives were having before his very eyes was much more ugly than he imagined. That's why he was very glad that he called the adults out here without letting the cousins catch wind of anything. Ugh. Yep. What's Umi Neko about? Arguing. But this is the boring arguing part. Perhaps because everyone was tired from this seemingly endless argument, they took a short break. It was decided this family conference inside the Golden Now should be moved over to the mansion. This place may have been gorgeous like a VIP room, but there was no heating and it was a little cold. It wasn't well suited for a long conversation. <laughs> yeah, she's like the audience, but she gets the front row stage. They thought of the possibility that someone might snatch the gold away while their backs are turned. But of course, no one was managed with just human hands and a small amount of time with ten tons of gold they're dealing with. In fact, it might be said that having this amount of gold in the background was actually robbing them of the ability to make sound decisions. So they agreed to return to the mansion in part so they could regain their composure and contain the conference more cold-bloodedly. Watch as I, I drop my level of fucks. To give whenever they argue. Then, if you would excuse me for the night, I imagine I'd just get in the way if I remain any longer. Sure, sorry. Did we bother you too much? Let us show our gratitude again tomorrow. Sorry for letting you see such an embarrassing side of us. You said that you refuse, but allow us to prepare a fitting portion of our gratitude for you as the first to discover the goal. Right, Nissan. Yes, we know that you're capable. I think you can grasp our current circumstances. Twenty billion yen in gold isn't something they wanted out in the open. They didn't want it outside, like Erica telling people about it. But of course, Erica had already reasoned out that much. She wore an unpleasant smile on her face, as though she understood it all too well. You don't need to worry about me. Of course, I have no desire to tell anyone else about this. And if I did, no one would believe me without proof. I got to see something interesting tonight. It was quite a spectacle, so I'm more than satisfied. Haha, <laughs> as in she's getting off on the drama. Uh-huh. <laughs> I see. I guess it's not every day you see ten tons of gold. Oh no, you know what she actually means. Seeing the gold was a spectacle? Of course not. Judging by Erica's dark nature, it's obvious she's so happy about. I thought about telling her to just go away, but even I wanted to get out of this place. I tried to head back to the guest house along with Erica. However, Kiri grabbed my shoulder. You're a part of this now! You can't go, Battler. Please come with us. You have to go to and enjoy the drama with us. Ah, oh, fuck! Yes, yes! You're now a real successor! You gotta have an audience with Father and have an analogy right away! <laughs> oh, yes. I actually saw somebody taste... Like, I, I had, like, um, a mutual or on YouTube and stuff talk about, like, kind of, like, how the board is, like, tur tur turned around and kind of, like, changed up in this way. Kind of, like, how, what happens in Higurashi Gosotsu. That was interesting. I won't talk about that because, uh, kind of spoilers, but I thought that was interesting. That's only something that the head, only head may decide. Don't make up things on your own. Okay, yeah. So they're arguing still. Valor, I realize it'll be a pain, but stick around for us for a bit longer. No. Don't say anything. Just stay quiet and keep your head down. Got it? 
Just do whatever you want. It would have been easy to say I had no interest in being the successor. But I was sure that would only add more oil to the fire. Ugh. Even if I had been ordered to keep quiet, saying shut up like a clam was clearly a good idea. In that case, would it really be so bad they just let me go back to the guest house? Sorry to waste your time, son. I just want to go play around with my cousins. Fuck this shit, bro. Dad put his arm firmly around my shoulder and I told him I was uncomfortable and to let go. <laughs> However, he didn't pay attention to a word I said. Balor committing murders. He's like, screw this. I'm gonna go with Black Balor theory and become Black Battler. I could not stand their bitching, so I killed them all. <laughs> Ah, here's the actual good part that I will give a shit about. I solved the epitaph. Just like you wanted. When you were the game master, we always get those letters. Try and solve the epitaph. If you don't, I'll kill you all. Why did she want to make us solve the riddle of the epitaph? By solving it, we found a mount of gold. Yippee for us. What about Beato? Does she gain anything by having us find the gold? Or does she lose something? As far as chessboard thinking tells us, people don't ever make moves that cause them to lose something. That means you must have something to gain by having us solve the epitaph. No. This child has nothing to gain from having someone solve the epitaph. Are you sure that's okay? Using red like that without her permission. This child most likely wishes for it. Virgilia, who would suddenly appear there, quickly gave an answer to my question with the red truth. In the past, I sometimes guessed that Beato tried to make us solve the epitaph, because she wanted to make us find the gold's hiding place for her, so she could snatch it away. Isn't that wrong too? Yes. In the first place, the gold of the Golden Land belongs to this child. She had absolutely no need to make someone find it for her, or to snatch it away herself. Of course. Beto is Beatrice the Golden. Isn't she the master of the Golden Land and the Ushiromiya family alchemist? That totally makes sense. However, that makes me even more confused. Even if someone exposed the answers to the epitaph's riddle, Beto has nothing to gain. No, to the contrary, her own gold might be stolen away. In that case, I'm understanding this less and less. I understand the epitaph murders. It might be revenge against the Ushinomiya family or else a ceremony to revive her powers as a witch. After all, she's probably doing it because of some reason or her goal of her own. But what's the point of her telling us this to solve the epitaph? Whether we solve it or not, she has nothing to gain at all. In other words, the whole issue of whether the epitaph is solved or not is immaterial in Beato's eyes. You're right. Whether the epitaph's riddle is solved or not, this child stands to gain nothing at all. It doesn't matter whether it's solved or not. In other words, we could say the epitaph's riddle itself is immaterial to Beato. You're right. The epitaph's riddle doesn't have any meaning for this child. So even if you take it to an extreme and call the epitaph's riddle immaterial, it may not be possible to argue against your claim. Beato. Why are you making us solve the epitaph's riddle? If we liken the witch, you're a pair of scales, the epitaph murders lie on one plate, and the riddle of the epitaph lies on the other plate. After all, she's saying she'll stop the epitaph murders if the epitaph is solved. In other words, the epitaph murders and the epitaph's riddles are worth the same to Beato, like two sides on a balanced scale. That means both the epitaph's riddle and massacring all the relatives are equally significant from Beato's point of view. But Virgilia responded with the red truth. Regardless of whether the epitaph is solved or not, Beato has nothing to gain. If she has nothing to gain, then this epitaph's riddle is meaningless and immaterial to Beato. In that case, how much of the epitaph murders which lie on the other side of the scales and are equal to the epitaph's riddle in value worth to her? Think. Don't stop thinking. The epitaph's murders and solving the riddle of the epitaph have equal worth. 
As long as the epitaph murders, which are Beto's goal each time, have the single way that they can be stopped. A way that she decided on herself. Both are worth the same thing to her. X equals Y. And whether the epitaph's riddle is solved or not, Beto has nothing to gain. Y equals zero. So in this case, what is X? Wait a sec. That means the epitaph murders are also meaningless and immaterial. Every time she performs these bizarre serial murders, she's willing to spend an incredible amount of effort to politely send an advance notice, and then kill us one by one in accordance with the epitaph never getting exposed. So all of that is meaningless to her? I spun the chessboard around, searched through Beato's moves over and over. This is always the first place I stumble. The significance of the epitaph murders. Why did she have to commit serial murders in a way that reproduced the witch's epitaph? If she wanted to kill the whole Ushinomiya family for revenge, it'd be much simpler, safer, and more reliable if she just po poisoned into our dinner. Or else went around killing everyone one by one in the middle of the night while they were sleeping. However, on the first evening, Beto sent us a letter that sounded like an advance notice, and then carried out a three-part serial murder with large gaps in between. The six people of the first twilight, the two people of the second twilight, and the five people of the fourth and later twilights. We aren't fools. Once the first murders occur, we barricade ourselves somewhere to stave off any further murders. Furthermore, we quickly suspect a culprit among us and start analyzing each other's alibis. As the victims increase, the number of suspects decreases automatically, and Beta's chances of success in this serial murder drop closer and closer to zero. All the epitaph murders are like she's strangling her own neck, making it hard to succeed in this serial murder she's attempting. All for a useless embellishment. All just for show. She's raising the difficulty of completing her own objective. That does follow. She really is a strange child. Did you know? In mystery novels, they call things like these epitaph murders plotline murders. I think you can split the possible motives for plotline murders like this into three groups. And what are those? Well, first off, following the epitaph gives rises to misconceptions about evidence and alibis, which might benefit the culprit. Pretending to be dead and mixing yourself in with the victims would fit this pattern. As with committing murders that don't actually follow the epitaph, giving yourself an alibi by getting people to incorrectly guess the order of events. I see. So perhaps she only made it look as though she was killing them in a ceremony of fashion, following the epitaph, and when she was actually guiding their thinking in a manner that benefited her. I do find that intriguing. However, in our games, the dead are truly down for the count thanks to the red. While she might be confused people in the world of the game of the board, she can't confuse us up here like that. In other words, the most obvious possible goal for her isn't the real one. In that case, what are the other two possible reasons for carrying out plotline murders? Another one is coincidence. A crime just happens to resemble the epitaph without anyone in particular trying to make it do so. The witnesses mistakenly think it's a plotline murder. Humans try to find a cause and effect in everything they see. If we think we know what something is, then that's how it looks to us. I see. That is intriguing too. But would that really work? In this child's games, advance notices of the crime is always given before the murders of the first twilight. Also, I believe you repeatedly found letters and circumstantial evidence that clearly show the culprit is carrying out epitaph murders. Yeah, that's right. It isn't coincidence. From the very beginning, Beatrice has been advancing with the goal of making this look like a series of epitaph murders. We weren't mistaken about that. These are clear plotline murders. So this motive, or lack of motive, doesn't work either. In that case, there is only one motive left, right? The last one is because they want to show someone something. More specifically, fear. By following the epitaph, she gives the others clear notice in advance that the other murders will continue. The survivors are in constant fear of the murders, which they are certain will continue. In other words, this child performed these epitaph murders to make someone else feel the fear of death. 
or at least that explained things pretty well. The grotesque mutilation of corpses and the dark decorations were all a show to terrify us. To terrify whom? Huh? Well, like I said, us. After hearing that one line, Virgilio spoke so casually, my thoughts clouded over once again. Is this really as sufficient to use the vague word us? There are many humans in the Ushiramiya family. There's the head and the one who holds the rank of his successor, grandfather and uncle Kraus. There's the relatives who have some pull in the business world. On the other side, you have the youngest cousins who usually visit at most once a year and the unfortunate servants who just happened to be on duty that day. Even the culprit hates all of us. There should be a clear difference in how much they hate some of us compared to the others. So it should be possible to pick out people amongst the culprit, especially wanted to terrorize or have revenge against. If we liken this to a kid eating dessert, isn't the strawberry on top of a shortcake the part you should eat last? No one tells you that you shouldn't eat it first, but our mentality encourages us to save it for later. I used to eat toppings first when I was younger or something. I, so then I would have too much leftover rice, and I hated rice because it's plain. In that case, oh wait. In that case, the culprit would want to leave the person they hated most until the end. Yeah, like that line by my favorite character in this novel I like. Something about how the worst way to kill someone is to murder them, clo murder those close to them first, making them as miserable as possible, and only killing the person then. In other words, I know Keiji's, oh, pff, I know Valor's favorite character, and oh look, it's a Higurashi reference. No spoiling Mikashi, but yeah. Oh my, that must have been a quite a terrifying novel. How frightening. In that case, you could argue that the people who stay alive until the end are the ones that Beato hates the most. However, every single time the order people get killed changes around completely. If we're trying to count the people who live until the very last twilight every single time, even though they do die in the end, I have to say something very that I that I find is one of my favorite things about the One They Cry series is that like it is fun to compare all the villains because they all parallel each other really well. And like I just love it, so I'm the only one. Let me first speak with the red. Balor isn't the culprit. Balor didn't kill anyone. This can be said of all games then that just makes it even more likely that it's me. It means the sole reason she had for bringing about the FTEP murders was to show them to me. Every time Beato brags that she'll choose whom to kill next with a roulette. However, I'm the only one she never kills. Though she does kill me in the end, she leaves me be until the very last moment. In all these supposed random games, there's just only one unchanging constant. She wants revenge against me? So is she performing the epitaph murders to make me feel fear? That's wrong. Her goal is not to make someone experience fear, and it isn't to have revenge on someone either. In that case, the epitaph murders really don't mean anything to her. The epitaph's riddle is meaningless, and the corresponding epitaph murders are also meaningless. X equals Y equals zero. But even so, she's clearly trying to show these meaningless things to me. What could she want from me that'd be worth the same to her as something meaningless? I don't get it! The more I think about it, the less I understand what she's thinking! Beatrice, the fickle witch who committed a meaningless, worthless string of serial murders. Even the Eftas riddle, which that witch used as a trigger that could suspend the serial murders, is meaningless, immaterial. And yet, she's thrusting this meaningless, immaterial thing in front of my face. What is it that you want from me? Or else, what is it that you're giving me? My idea that Beato has clearly been taking revenge on me has already been denied by Virgilia's red truth. Both X and Y, both the Epitaph murders and the Epitaph's riddle 
hold no meaning for Beatrice. X equals Y equals zero. Have her, since she's been thrusting those things in front of me. They must have some meaning. She showed us the scales representing, if you don't solve the epitaph, I'll cure the epitaph's murders. In other words, neither the epitaph's murders nor the epitaph's riddle have any significance by themselves. However, it becomes meaningful when she puts both halves on the scales and puts on the display before us. No, before me. In other words, it should be like this. X equals zero. Y equals zero. X plus Y is more than zero. I hope I read that right. I'm not good at reading those. A scale with meaningless, weightless things on both sides. However, it has weight itself and gives the rest meaning. It's almost like playing. Like kids playing rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors is an extremely familiar method of randomly determining a winner and a loser. You sometimes wager some sort of reward on the outcome, but kids often do rock, paper, scissors just to play without betting anything in particular. Unless you bet something, you have nothing to gain or lose except happiness and frustration. In other words, the two sides of the scale, both winning and losing, are immaterial. However, the very act of seeing which way it will tip is the very reason kids play rock, paper, scissors. After all, the kids are enjoying the communication that surrounds the game. And they aren't purely interested in the value of winning or losing. They aren't overly concerned about who wins and who loses. That would mean it doesn't matter to Beato whether the epitaph murders succeed or not. It almost feels like she's just enjoying the process. In the past, I cursed her, deciding that she was a heartless witch who kept murdering people for no reason. But right now, I can't imagine that's true. Thank you. In that case, I'll give you one more line of red. Beto never committed murder for the sake of pleasure. She didn't do for pleasure, and she didn't do it to make anyone feel fear. So she has nothing to gain. She doesn't care whether the epitaph murder succeed or fail. It's almost like a random game kids would play. That's not right. It does have meaning. It has meaning for her. And what is this meaning? I don't get it. Even though both sides of the scale are immaterial, the scale itself has some weight to it in her eyes. Of course it isn't meaningless. Some meaning definitely exists. In the previous game, she urged me to remember my sin of six years ago. Am I supposed to believe that that was meaningless too? No. That definitely isn't the case. I clearly remember the serious gaze Beato had back then. Unfortunately, I didn't have a clue what she meant. When I saw that, she was... When she saw that, she was horribly dejected. That's right. At that time, I'm sure she went even as far as to say the crime wouldn't have even occurred if I hadn't come. It does have meaning. It means something to her. And it's connected to something she wants from me. I laughed softly and poked Beato lightly on the head and patted her head. Next time you want to send a love letter, I suggest you just write, I love you. If you make it too roundabout and confusing, no one's going to be able to figure it out. <laughs> I still don't have a clue what she's thinking. Even so, I won't stop thinking. I've only just started spinning the chessboard around. I definitely won't give up on this journey in search of your thoughts.